Okay, hi guys, we're back. So today we have a new program and uh, we're dealing with timeouts again. And what we want to do is we want to show how you can match uh, timeouts based on their function and their user data supplied and how you can remove them based on that information. So let me run this program first and I will show you what the output looks like. Oops. Yeah, so let's try that again. So if I run this, notice that what's happening here is I am, uh, these, these numbers here, okay, are printing out. Actually, I didn't have the zero there, but they're printing out that many seconds. So at, you know, one second, the zero prints out at three seconds, and so on. Those aren't the numbers. The numbers that are printing are here. But you ask yourself, okay, how often are they printing? Well, they're printing at that time interval. So as x goes 0, 1, 2, 3, so if you pl supply 0, 1, 2, 3 here, you get these output numbers. So those are the seconds in the future when this alarm will be called with that user data. And what is that user data? This is the user data that gets passed. By the way, just a side note, whenever you pass, in this case we're passing integers, and an integer is immutable, so that's okay. So we can pass strings, integers, but you cannot pass a list as user data to a timeout function. So just to be aware of that. Notice though that when we run it, all of the um, all of these values in L are being added to this uh, browser or list box. And um, we can type in, as the program is running, we can type in a value here. It's finished now because it's already printed everything out. But as it's going, we can type a number in here and remove that matching callback, or sorry, timeout. Now understand here that after, well actually I only have one, two, but I have two threes and two fours and two fives. I'm gonna try taking out the two threes. And notice that it doesn't just take out, well when I run it, you'll see what I mean. So, um, let's take a look at the functions. So, this is the timeout function, alarm timeout. And so, here I'm adding, I have to convert the number, by the way, to a, uh, a string in order to add it to the, to the browser or the list box. But, um, notice here, I'm sending a third optional argument, which is the user data lx. That lx is num. That's the num that is accepted into the timeout. Okay? And so this timeout happens at these intervals in seconds. At one second, three seconds, five seconds. Because of this function here, or this formula here. Okay? I want to I wanna be some, I want to uh, clarify this. This loop, lines 27 and 28, are executed instantaneously. There's no delay in running this loop. So all these timeouts are created instantly. Okay? Because it takes almost no time for this, you know, I'm not sure if I have like 10 numbers here or so, something like that. All these timeouts are added instantly but they don't execute instantly because these times are in the future. Add timeout arguments are time, function, user data. So the function alarm to is here and that's what happens at that time. And the, and the user data is passed as num. Okay? Now, so what, what does the remove match do? Well, the remove match will remove timeout based on what's in the input. So if I run it again 
And if you can see here, this is my input. I can type something in here. So if let's say I type in four, and now I click remove, it'll actually skip not only one of the fours, but both of them. So it found two matching instances. Notice it went, it skipped yeah, after three, it goes five, five. And because I typed in the four and cl clicked remove matching, let's go take a look at the remove matching function here. Essentially what it's saying is remove any timeouts that match these two arguments, which is the function name, alarm timeout, and the user data. Now in this case, the user data is coming from my input uh, widget. I'm type, literally typing it in. But of course, I have to remember an input uh, widget will return uh, a string. I have to change it back in, in, into an integer such that uh, it matches. Even though, it, like the number four as a string is not going to match the number four as an integer. So that's kind of cool. So in other words, it doesn't just take out the first instance, but all instances that match the function name and the user data. So once again, if I run it, I can now type in, let's say, three. And watch, I'll let one of them show up. And then in, when I click it, the other, the second three doesn't show up, and then it goes to four, and then five. But if I run it again, and this time, let's say I type in the three before it shows up, now you'll notice that both of the threes, and in fact, it doesn't matter how many there are, even if there was hundreds of them, all those timeouts are going to be removed. So what I'm trying to show here, and this isn't well documented, by the way, in the documentation, because if we do go to the documentation, okay, so here's remove timeout documentation. It just says remove timeout handler, CV, that's the, that's the timeout callback function. And then there's a optional user data arg p, which has a default value of zero, which is, which in Python, it's, it's not used if you don't supply it. But notice it doesn't say that it matches both the function name and the user data second argument. So perhaps maybe they would update that documentation in the future. But in terms of the code, it's definitely doing that. Now let's try it one more time. And this time, let's try calling the other, uh, pressing the other button. So notice this one says remove all. When I click that, so let's take a look at um, the code there. That's right here. You can see it on line 14. So in this case, I'm removing the timeout, but I'm not specifying the user data at all. I'm simply specifying the function name. And in that case, it matches all of those functions, regardless of what the associated user data is. So that's the way timeouts can be added and removed. And the really nice thing about this that I want to emphasize here is that here on line 28, you can actually specify things in this loop. Once again, I'm going to reiterate, this loop executes instantaneously. All, you know, 10 or so of those, uh, how many are there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, yeah, okay. Are all added instantly, but they're not executed instantly. They're executed in the future based on a formula that you might type in. And that formula, in my case, X, is based on X, which is the uh, index of this loop. OK? And so they are executed at specific times in the future. 
This is very, very useful, especially for certain types of games, which we're going to be doing in the future. Um, okay, so one more thing that I've done to kind of explain how this works is I've put a print statement on line 28. I'm printing the time in the future the function is going to be called. I'm printing the function name that's going to be executed and I'm printing the user data that which is passed to the function. And in this way when I run it you can see that that data is generated instantly as soon as the program is run but then those callbacks here are um, you see what happened there so the, the they, they show up later in the future but I'm actually taking whatever matches in terms of the function name and the user data so if, if this well in this case the 5 right I typed in 5 as you can see so it matched this but it doesn't just take out the first instance it takes out both these instances so the the timeout at 17 and 19 seconds did not happen okay all right okay so here's a new program uh, let's just show you what it looks like so here it is it's a it's a stopwatch and it's using timeouts again when I click start it will start ticking and turning clockwise and if I hit stop it stops ticking and it ticks once every second and then I can click start again and it continues from where it was and I can stop it and notice when I click stop now stop is uh, I can't click it again, it's deactivated. And once I click start, I can't click start again, it's deactivated, but I can click stop now. And if I click stop, now I can also click reset, which takes it back to the beginning, it sets this to zero and sets that back to the top again. Let's go take a look at the code as to how this works. Um, also, I changed the scheme as well. So. I've added my widgets down here. So I've added my buttons, my start button, my stop button, my reset button, and my output, my, which is the, the time that's displayed. And the dial is the clock. And the, in terms of the dial, that's here in um, the documentation. FL dial and angle one is the minimum angle, angle two is the maximum angle, and also what's important here is that it says by default the values, the minimum and maximum values are 45 and 315 and zero is straight down. So if we take a look at um, this, here graphic uh, let's actually just okay so zero is straight down right there and then 45 and 315 are the default arguments so it's, essentially it's like think of it as a knob you turn like let's say for the volume of something uh, that's essentially what it's used for and if you look at the uh, what the widget actually looks like then I think that makes quite a lot of sense right because this is the default knob so this isn't really exactly supposed to be used for a clock that's what I'm using it for um, but essentially it's like a control widget that you can twist and just like a volume knob and go from you know minimum to maximum that's why uh, minimum is at 45 and maximum is at 315 but what I've done is I have stated that my minimum and maximum are 180 and 181 now you might think why did I choose 181 
And the reason for that is because I want it to go all the way around, and I also want it to go around clockwise. So if we look at the documentation here, it says default values, zero degrees straight down, and angles progress clockwise. Normally, angle one is less than angle two, which is the maximum, right? Angle one is minimum, angle two is maximum. But if you reverse them, the dial moves counterclockwise. So I want my dial to move clockwise. So therefore, I want angle two to be greater than angle one. In addition, I want it to go all the way around. And so therefore, I have my values as in my code, uh, 180 for angle one and 181 for angle two. Um, now, in terms of, okay, so in terms of the dial type, I'm using line dial. So if, you, if we look at the documentation in terms of what it looks like, that's the line dial. There's also a fill dial, which uh, I, could, I was playing with. And um, that one, if we try that one out, all we have to do is just uncomment that and comment this out. And then now, um, it's a fill dial. And th these colors, the white is the background, and the red is like the foreground of the color of the widget. So if I run this, and start it, then you'll see what it looks like. So it's just a different type of uh, a knob, of, a, of a, a dial knob, OK? OK, and the last thing I wanted to mention with this program is the I'm increasing by 6, because all the way around is 360, right? So if we take a look at the math, so essentially, you're going around uh, 360 degrees in 60 seconds. So that's 6 degrees per second. And that's why I'm adding 6, for every, six degrees for every um, second. So notice how I'm doing that. I'm going value. I'm getting the value, adding 6, and setting that as the new value. Notice how the get and the set work, right? get takes no arguments here for value and the set takes arguments for the value there okay and this is this timeouts happening once every second with repeat timeout so essentially uh, it looks like a clock with a second uh, hand okay and there is my activate and deactivate for the start and stop buttons Okay, so uh, for, the, for our, uh, the last part of this lesson, I want to give you a little mini assignment. I want you to create a window, and I want you to create, uh, let's say you could make them three boxes. And then I want you to have a button here. And um, let's call this button let's call it flash and so when you click this button I want this box first I want it to change color so let's say let's say initially it's um, let's say initially well maybe the backgrounds gonna be white how about we'll make it uh, green initially and then I want it to turn red for one second and then back to green and then I want the same thing to happen to this thing but I want this to happen um, after this one turns back to green so one second in between so in other words this turns red for one second so red for one second. And then one second later, this turns red for one second. And then one second later, this turns red 
for one second. And then it turns back. So after that one second is up, though, they all change back to green. Okay? Give that a shot and see if you can do it, and we'll go over the solution next time. Good luck.